Cults, a community devoted to the gospel of their self-proclaimed prophet. Go over to the morgue and look at all the dead people. A prophet who will isolate the members of their flock and twist their ideologies and morals. Rid themselves of human behavior, human activity, human thinking. Before systematically destroying their lives. Uh, this is regarding a mass suicide, and I can give you the address. In 1977, Jim Jones had inspired freedom and an urge to fight against what they believed was a draconian government. We raise food, we have everything is so much different up here than back in the States. He uprooted his followers from the US to Guyana, where they settled into their new lives in Jonestown. That's their lovely little house, and it's so darling inside. Maybe we can take a walk out there and see it. It was meant to be a haven for all, a loving community brought together by their faith and a calling to the lost that they were always welcome into this idyllic community. I love it. I love it. It's, I love it better than any place I've been in my life. One year later, over 900 members of the People's Temple would be dead. We've lived as no other people have lived and loved. We've had as much of this world as you're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. Trying, so everybody will relax. The best thing you do to relax, and you have no problem. In this first Beyond the Dark special, we shall delve into one cult that nearly succeeded in its plans of annihilating an entire country and investigating the years leading up to and after their infamous attack. <laughs> Tokyo, Japan, March 20th, 1995. Commuters are boarding trains in the Tokyo Metro preparing for a hard day's work after the relaxing weekend. Many are discussing the upcoming national holiday and setting plans to be with their loved ones. Among them is a man carrying a lethal package. However, he is not alone. Four others have taken up positions on separate trains in a coordinated attack. These men are intelligent, academic, and highly educated. They are doctors, scientists, and university graduates. All of them are being manipulated by a so-called prophet who has claimed to have visions of the decimation of man. Their mission is to initiate and engineer the start of the apocalypse. So how do men of this caliber and social standing become killers? What drives people like Akua Hayashi, a cardiac specialist and the eldest of the attackers, to go from saving lives to taking them? We have to go back 40 years to the birth of their so-called prophet of destruction, Shoko Asahara. Yatsushiro, Kumamoto Prefecture, 1955. The Matsumoto family are working hard to get by on the little wage they earn, and the father spends his hot afternoons as a tatami straw mat maker, and each day is a struggle to feed his large family. But he perseveres in hope that his children can live better lives. Later that year, on March 2nd, Miss Matsumoto gives birth to a baby boy and they name him Chizu Matsumoto. There are seven children in total, five boys and two girls. However, they notice something different about the newborn. After the doctor checks the child for any complications, the parents are informed that Chizu has infantile glaucoma, leaving him blind in his left eye and only partially sighted in his right. Years of hardship continue to plague the family as they survived in poverty, the only income still being the father's struggling mat-making business. Chizu, now six years old, had a chance to succeed in life and was sent to Kumamoto Prefectural School for the Blind where he would live in the school's dormitories. The parents had hoped with an education and a facility equipped to deal with his disability, he would go on to become successful, or at the very least, happy. While at school, Chizu had gained himself some notoriety as a bully. Because he had some vision compared to his peers, he would take advantage and torment the other students. Classmates would later comment, once he got mad, there was no stopping him. After many intervening years, he would later move to Tokyo, where he unsuccessfully sought enrollment in Tokyo University. But he would later graduate from a junior college in March of 1975. 
and even later received some informal training as an acupuncturist. After starting a family with his wife in 1977, it appeared Chizu had finally gained the happiness his father had hoped for. In these early times, he was intensely working to support his family and dedicated his free time to the study of various religious concepts, from Chinese astrology to Indian esoteric yoga and Buddhism. He even opened his own pharmacy in the city of Chiba, specializing in Chinese medicines and using his skill in acupuncture to heal the residents. However, sometime between 1981 and 1982, he was arrested for selling fake remedies. Although he was never jailed for the offense, he was fined 200,000 yen and the pharmacy and Chizu went bankrupt. After his trial and a period of spiritual crisis, he later joined a Gongshu, a Buddhist religious group in the early 1980s as a part of his religious pilgrimage. One of its main practices was 1,000 consecutive days of offerings. Those who offered money daily throughout this period were promised true enlightenment. Despite struggling to support his family and the financial crisis, Chizu completed the course. But enlightenment never came. After this disheartening event, he left a Gongshu and established his own new religion, Om Shinsen no Kai, in 1984. He had begun handing out leaflets, preaching on street corners, teaching yoga, and healing through the use of herbal medicines from his small, one-bedroom apartment in Tokyo's Shibuya district, where he lived with his wife and children. After a few years, his efforts seemed to be paying off, and it was during this period that he gained support of his first and most loyal disciples. However, financial hardship continued to plague the family, as he refused to accept any payment for his teachings, stating that accepting money went against what he was taught, and that only those who have achieved true enlightenment may accept material offerings. Not much else is known about Chizu Matsumoto's early life, but what is known is after establishing Om Shinsen no Kai, he would later change his name to Shoko Asahara, and the religion to Om Shinriko. It's 1987, and Shoko Asahara has just returned from a religious pilgrimage from India. While there, he claimed to have reached his one true goal of enlightenment, and his closest disciples were very quick to offer him money for his teachings. By this point, the members began to rapidly grow as Shoko would go on an intense recruitment campaign, from funding a studio to direct an anime, <laughs> specialized recruitment videos, and multiple day yoga seminars. The effort Shoko put in didn't go unrecognized as he was interviewed on multiple occasions by people like Takeshi Katano. And show off his supposed supernatural abilities in an attempt to bring in more members. However, he also caught the attention of one Satsumi Sakamoto. Yokohama, Japan, 4th of November, 1989. Several own members are waiting outside a Yokohama train station. They are carrying with them a total of 14 hypodermic syringes and a supply of potassium chloride. They have been ordered by Asahara to kidnap the lawyer Satsumi Sakamoto as he comes home from work. But there's a problem. It was a holiday known as Culture Day, and Satsumi was at home with his family instead of at work. Upon realizing this, Hideo Murai, 
Ohm's chief scientist leading the group, decided to drive to the lawyer's apartment to improvise his own plan. How did Satsumi become a target? What did he do to cause Shoko Asahara to send a death squad? Satsumi Sakamoto was known as an anti-cult lawyer. He had previously gone against the Unification Church stating that the members were being held against their will and threatened if they tried to leave. After he won the case, the group suffered a serious financial blow. In 1988, he had organized a similar lawsuit against Om Shinriko, stating the members did not join the group voluntarily, but were lured in, manipulated, and threatened. During the proceedings, he set up Om Shinriko Victims Association in an attempt to help any members break away from the group. He also stated that the religious items Om was selling were far higher than their market value and were draining the members' funds. However, this wasn't the catalyst that sent Asahara to extreme measures. At this time, Om Shinrika was applying to become recognized as a religious organization, thus making them tax-exempt. However, Om had been rather callous with its own actions. They set up picketing lines around government buildings in an attempt to rush the procedure. If Satsumi won the lawsuit, it would severely damage Ohm's reputation and even destroy the possibility of them being seen as a recognized religion. But there was still one last event that made Satsumi a target. In 1989, Sakamoto was able to persuade Shoko Asahara to submit to a blood test. Asahara claimed he had special powers and they were present throughout his entire body. Naturally, he found no signs of anything unusual or supernatural. That same month, the Tokyo Broadcast System taped an interview with Sakamoto regarding his anti-Ohm efforts. However, the network secretly showed a video of the interview to members of Ohm without Sakamoto's knowledge. Ohm officials later pressured the station to cancel the planned broadcast of the interview, and Asahara sent members to deal with Susumi. It's 3 a.m. Hideo Murai and the rest of the group have quietly entered Sakamoto's apartment through an unlocked door. As soon as they enter, Satsumi Sakamoto is struck on the head with a hammer, but he refuses to go down. His wife, Satoko, has been wrestled to the floor as own members attempt to kick her to death. As the parents fight for their lives, their 14-month-old infant son, Tashuhiko, is currently being injected with the potassium chloride, and his face is being wrapped in cloth. During the struggle, Satoko and Susumi are both injected and his wife succumbs to the poison. But Susumi refuses to go down without a fight. Because of this, one of the members tackles him to the floor where he is strangled. Now that the Sakamoto family is dead, the bedsheets are burned, the teeth are smashed, and the tools are dropped into the ocean. Once this is done, their bodies are placed in three separate metal drums and are later hidden in three separate prefectures around Japan. After the family's disappearance, it would take six years before the authorities learned what happened. It is believed the murder was designed to intimidate lawyers and any members wanting to leave Om Shinriko. But the resulting case against the cult was dropped, and they were recognized as a religious corporation by the Tokyo government. However, Sakamoto wasn't the first murder. In 1988, an Ohm member died during one of the cult's thermal training sessions. Followers would soak in a bathtub for long hours with the water's temperature reaching around 50 degrees Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit. It was designed as a way to cleanse the souls and rid it of impurities. With Ohm's reputation already being strained with accusations of forcing members to stay and further allegations of kidnapping escaped members, the body was secretly incinerated. When 21-year-old Shuji Taguchi, a relatively new member of the group, asked if he could leave the cult after witnessing the event, Shoko Asahara instructed Kiyohide Hayakawa to silence the young man. As he was preparing to flee the cult, a rope was wrapped around his neck and he was murdered in February of 1989. It would later come to light that the members involved in both murders were high-ranking officials of the cult, from their chief scientist to Asahara's personal bodyguard. Under strict orders, they would carry out any demands he asked of them and would be key players in events to come, except for one member. 
Kazuaki Okazaki had fled the cult after the murder of Susumi Sakamoto and took around 300 million yen of the cult's money with him. He would later set up and run a cram school in the Yamaguchi prefecture, and over the years he would blackmail Shoko Asahara by threatening to tell the police about the cult's crimes. He would later demand that Asahara paid a total of 10 million yen. It's 1990, and Japan was in the beginning of an economic downfall. Many Japanese salarymen were forced to find different lines of work, and the younger generation began to move in with their parents as living independently became increasingly difficult. It was during this tough period Ohm used the economic crisis to his advantage, as they would offer jobs to citizens at their restaurants and electronic businesses. While under employment, you'd be persuaded to join the group. However, it came with a caveat. Once you was a part of Ohm, you had to sign over your estate. With Asahara's teachings gaining more and more followers, the recruitment campaign also went into full gear. By funding more anime and manga, he was attempting to bring in the otaku crowd who were seen as society's outcasts. It was during this time Shoko Asahara and 25 of his members tried to run for the lower house of representatives, but none were elected. As the numbers grew, he had amassed a following of doctors, scientists, and university students. Due to the societal pressures at the time to be more successful and beat the economic downturn, Ohm was considered a retreat for many from their high-pressured lives. After sending a small group of Ohm members on a religious conquest to Russia, Asahara's teachings got more intense. Japan didn't know it, but Shoko Asahara was preparing for war. It's 1997, and the United States has engulfed Japan in nuclear fire. As the world descends into chaos, the unrelenting torment takes its toll on survivors who now live under the blanket of nuclear winter. Their bodies slowly decay as they are eaten away by cancers, and the radiation has tainted the food and water supplies. At least, this is what Asahara is preaching. After failing to get elected into the lower house of representatives, Asahara's teachings became more paranoid and revolved around the incoming apocalypse. As he struck fear and paranoia into his followers, he would preach how Western culture had tainted Japan's traditional values and materialism decayed the soul, despite Asahara having assets worth an estimated $1 billion. As the members became more and more disillusioned by his teachings, Asahara decided to speed up his apocalyptic predictions. It's October 1992, and Ohm's public image was turning even more hostile as the allegations mounted. Shoko Asahara was attempting to gain good publicity by leading a small group of Ohm doctors and nurses on a medical mission to Zaire in Central Africa. By preaching about the religion, healing the sick, and supporting the local communities, it seemed as if Ohm was attempting to turn a new leaf and share the love and peace Asahara rigorously preached. However, it was a cover for their true sinister mission. In August of 1976, Zaire suffered a serious Ebola outbreak. By the end of the epidemic, the virus took the lives of 280 of the residents. Asahara was fascinated by the lethal Ebola virus and wanted to learn as much as he could about it, and if possible, bring a sample back to Japan and use it as a biological weapon. Upon his return and failing to get a sample of the virus, Asahara shifted his focus towards the manufacturing of nerve agents such as sarin and VX. In 1993, the cult bought a large sheep ranch in Perth, Australia. After a few months, they would routinely test the newly developed gas on the livestock to document its lethality for future attacks. However, Ohm was also experimenting with a deadly disease. Tokyo, Koto Ward, June 29th, 1993. The residents are going about their day-to-day -day lives shopping, socializing, and heading to and from work. It is just an average day in Japan's most populous metropolis, but they begin to notice something rather peculiar. During the morning hours, a foul odor slowly drifts into the streets. A few of the residents start to feel the effects of the miasma and immediately report it to the environmental health authorities. 
As they start their investigation, the officials find that the odor is originating from an eight-story high building. It is revealed that the building belongs to Ohm Shinriko. The next day, on June 30th, the health authorities got a further 41 complaints about the foul odor. However, this time, the symptoms were more severe. Residents were suffering from appetite loss, nausea, and in more extreme cases, projectile vomiting. Due to the complaints, officials request permission to inspect the building's interior, but own members deny them entry. Because of this, they check the building's surroundings, collect air samples, and begin to survey the building's activities. But other than the odor, they find no other issues. On the morning of July 1st, neighbors report loud banging noises and a mist emanating from one of the two cooling towers on the building's roof. As the day progressed, residents living south of the tower complained about their pets falling ill and increased nausea and vomiting. A further 118 complaints about the miasma was reported to the Environmental Health Office and the misting continued throughout the day as a gelatin-like black fluid was seen on the side of the building. After the environmental officials collected the samples, the local residents forced Shoko Asahara to agree to cease using the rooftop device and to clean and vacate the building. When officials inspected the building on July 16th, no equipment remained although they noted black stains covered the walls and ceiling. After their infamous attack, own members testified that the odors were being caused by their efforts to aerosolize anthrax in an attempt to cause an epidemic. It should also be noted that a few days after Asahara was forced to shut down the building, two own members were apprehended by Australian customs for carrying dangerous chemicals onto an aeroplane in Perth. After their failed attack, own members were involved in a series of break-ins. From the Tokyo Police Department where they stole driver's license data, breaking into Nippon Electronics to obtain information on laser technology, and finally, the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, where they stole technical documents in a vague hope to build tanks and artillery. It was also during this time, Asahara ordered his chief engineer to begin the manufacturing of 1,000 AK-74s in preparation of their violent takeover. However, just before the break-ins, Ohm was successful in one attack that shook Japan to its core. Thank you all very much for watching. I would like to reinforce as usual, I am not a native Japanese speaker, so please forgive any mispronunciations you may have heard. This project is quite possibly the biggest thing I've worked on and I haven't even grazed the surface of the cult's activities, so I do hope you'll join me in part two, where we shall cover not only their infamous attack, but many other key events committed by Ohm. I've been Mr. Blank, and you've been watching Beyond the 